So uh, welcome to our capstone design project presentation, Sierra, the next generation biosensor. I'm Allison, this is my partner Chelsea, and our other partner Krishna is taking care of our booth in the foyer. So yeah, you can click mine. So this is what we're going to take you through today. We're going to give you an introduction to the theory behind our technology, um, insight into um, the market potential, um, an overview of our design, the, the methods we use to build it, and then the validation tests, um, and then the development of our prototype, and how this all ties into our plans for the future. So our uh, sensor is a gold nanoparticle sensor, which works based on the phenomenon called localized surface plasmon resonance, also known as LSPR. So the surface electron of these really small gold nanoparticles, um, 80 nanometers in diameter, is what we used, interact with light waves to affect the color of the visible light. So you have your gold nanoparticle here, and then you give it some kind of stimulus. So say the, this blue triangle protein is binding to these gold nanoparticles. Oops. Um, so then you would have some kind of change in the color, the signal from the photospectrometer that you can measure to detect that binding. So LSPR is a really great technology because it's label free. You don't have to attach any fluorescence molecules or prep the sample before it's used. You can see the results in real time and it's highly sensitive. In the nanogram or microgram per milliliter concentration range. And it's a new technology um, gaining popularity over the past decade. And so it's a great time to be developing this technology. So quickly, this is an overview of the label free detection market and things that already exist there. And you won't even see LSPR on this chart because it's so new and it's, there aren't a lot of commercial LSPR sensors available right now. So I'm going to give you two examples specifically of uh, big market players. So we have over here, this is a BioCore X100 SPR system. And this is a really high throughput sensor. Uh, but if you look at the cost, that is pretty um, inhibiting to anyone with a small research budget. This is the cheapest of their line of BioCore sensors and it's over $100,000. And each chip, not even necessarily reusable, um, three of them cost $1,000. And so something, the closest thing we're able to find to what we made is this bio-layer interferometry sensor called the Blitz from Forte Bio. And it's a single sensor, portable desktop thing, but you can still see it costs $20,000. And you have to buy the probes in packs of 96 because most of their other devices are high throughput uh, that use the probes. So we can see currently in the market, the sensors are sensi highly sensitive. They have decent throughput, uh, high throughput, like the BioCore system. Some of them are portable, most of them aren't, and none of them are cost effective. So that's, uh, this is the area that we hope to attack with our project Sierra, is a low cost and portable sensor. The prototype we were able to make costs only about $1,000, and that's without the economy of scale. And our probes all are also under a dollar each. So you can have less than a dollar per test. And it's very versatile. You can tailor these gold nanoparticles to sense many, many different molecules, whether it's for personal care, environmental monitoring, or um, research purposes. So this is why we call this an enabling technology, because it's going to enable sensing applications that weren't possible before. So our design focuses on coupling a white LED with a fiber optic cable. Um, this image here shows that the white LED is the light source, and the optical fiber contains uh, the nanoparticles right on a tip. Uh, these gold nanoparticles are functionalized and absorbed onto the glass fiber tip using uh, a charged polymer. So with having the fiber directly attached into the LED, we maximize the amount of light that travels through the fiber, through the sensing surface, and into the spectrometer. The spectrometer is run using any sort of computing device, whether it be a desktop, um, your tablet, or even your smartphone. So to choose the most um, appropriate optical fiber for our device, we analyzed how the numerical aperture, or NA, affects the exiting angle, which we label alpha, as well as the distance from the fiber tip to the collimating lens, which we label H. We found that as NA increased, alpha, alpha also increased, but H decreased. And we concluded that um, optical fibers with numerical apertures of 
uh, 0 0.22, 0 0.39, and 0.48 all yielded reasonable values for our purpose, and so we chose these fibers to continue with experimentation. Also, we did some, sorry, also we did some ray tracing uh, simulations, which showed that, previous? which showed that the bulk of the light transmission happens at very low <coughs> angles, shown in this image here. And that means that most of the light emanating from the fiber tip will pass through the sensing surface and be collected by the spectrometer optics. So now we'll briefly discuss our procedure for uh, probe fabrication. So we start with a very basic LED. We use very coarse sandpaper to file down the dome, as shown in this image. Um, then we use fine polishing paper to get a real, really clear finish so we can precision drill a hole right over top of the LED die. Then we use epoxy as a refractive index matching glue um, to uh, securely align the fiber into the LED die. Once that's all cured, we black out the LED and the fiber, and then we functionalize the tip with gold nanoparticles. This is a picture of our final probe. So after we've created our probes, we decided to make a lab scale experimental setup where we could test them. Um, this image highlights all the main components. We have A, the probe and its holder, B, uh, power to the LED, C, the sample well with the collimating lens right below, and D, the spectrometer. So with this, um, our probe was made and our lab skill set up, we were able to run through a bunch of validation tests as we went along. So we looked at the layout of the gold nanoparticles on the fiber using SEM, which is the scanning electron microscope. And then we took our probes and we looked at the absorbance spectra and we analyzed the signal quality for, for noise over time and also just the general quality of the peak. And then we took our probe and we, uh, we applied it to two real life sensing applications. One is to sense the refractive index of a medium, and the other one is to, uh, to sense the binding of, sorry, of the protein streptavidin. So this is a really cool image. This is the scanning electron microscope image of our fiber. This is only a 279 time zoom. If anyone's seen a fiber optic cable before, it's, you can hardly even see the face with your eye. So around here, you can kind of see it looks very dotty on the face of the fiber, and that is the gold nanoparticle layer. So we zoom in even more. We have on the left here, this is 5,000 times zoomed, and you can see very clearly the dispersion of the gold nanoparticles. So this kind of fairly even dispersion is something that we want, and it's a very positive result. It's something that we would look for to improve in the future is the, uh, the density of the dispersion. So would, we would play around with the concentration of the polymer or the nanoparticles and the incubation time in our fab process. And on the left is something we learned. Um, this is a negative result. Uh, you can see a lot of surface roughness. So we learned the importance of polishing the fiber very well with the extremely fine uh, polishing paper so that you don't get surface roughness like this interfering with the quality of your optical signal. So then we took these probes and we, we have software that takes the absorbance spectrum which kind of looks like this, like a Gaussian curve, and it fits it to a Gaussian and measures the peak of that, um, that curve over time. So the blue line is the peak location of the absorbance spectrum over time. And with no stimulus, you want it to look flat. And if you look at the scale of the y-axis, it's in picometers. So we actually achieved very good noise levels. Um, our signal-to-noise ratio was um, 6.5, and usually what's considered um, a, significant, a sufficient signal to noise ratio to sense is three, and below which you wouldn't be able to distinguish a signal from noise. So we definitely have um, a ratio in which we can, which is a, sufficient for sensing. And um, our drift was about 170 picometers over the course of half an hour. Um, and something we'd want to explore in the future is the effects of temperature on, um, on the drift. So these are the absorbance spectra of six different probes that we made. Um, they have three different numerical apertures, the 0 0.22, 0 0.39, and 0.48 that Chelsea mentioned. And so by comparing these absorbance spectra, we decided that the 0.48 was the optimal choice. Because the, um, the, and that's the one in blue. So because their peaks are 
um, consistently in the same location, and they have a high intensity and a very nice peak shape. So next, we characterize the refractive index sensitivity, or RIS, of our sensor. Um, RIS is a standard figure of merit for optical sensors. It is dependent on the nanoparticle size, its shape, its aspect ratio, as well as the material. Um, so how we tested this was we measured the LSPR peak wavelength for different, uh, numerous different solutions, which were made up of glycerol, water, and sucrose water mixtures. We made these mixtures to cover a large range of refractive indices, which we then confirmed experimentally using an Abe refractometer. So the top image here shows the results of our refractive index sensitivity test using our 0.48 uh, numerical aperture probe. Our average RIS was 94 nanometers per refractive index unit, and the variation between that between the two trials was 12.3% difference, which we feel is acceptable and falls within our requirements for cross-probe consistency. Um, during that set of testing, the minimal refractive index change that we found was uh, 0.0042 refractive index units, and our ideal goal uh, for detection was 0.01 refractive index units, so we definitely achieved that requirement and much more. So the next set of testing we did was biomolecule sensing. And for this, we used the biotin streptavidin system, which is, um, it has a very high affinity, and it's a standard a system for biosensor validation testing. So the image here shows our LSPR peak wavelength recorded in real time for the whole duration of the test. First, we gather a stable baseline in water. Then we expose the system to thiolated biotin, which binds to the nanoparticle gold surface. Um, we flow buffer through the system in between each binding event as a wash and to create a new baseline. Next, we used thiolated PEG, or polyethylene glycol, which was just to fill in all the empty spaces on the surface and inhibit nonspecific binding of our target molecule, which was streptabidin. So we tested three concentrations of streptavidin, including 5, 50, and 500 nanomolar concentrations. We were unable to reliably detect the 5 nanomolar, but if we zoom in, um, you can see that we were able to de detect 50 nanomolar streptavidin quite well, um, as shown in this beautiful binding curve here. Um, and it resulted in a total LSPR peak shift of 0.88 nanometers. The average over the two trials of this test that were run was a peak shift of one nanometer. So the 50 nanomolar streptabdin that we were able to detect is equivalent to 2.64 micrograms per milliliter. And to give you some insight into the device's sensing capabilities, here are a few examples of molecules that can be found in a similar concentration to what we were able to detect in streptabdin. So first, in medical diagnostics, we could detect, we could potentially detect a cardiac marker called myoglobin, which is found in elevated levels well, before you're about to have a heart attack. In more of the research side of things, we could detect the immunomarker C-reactive protein, which is elevated and indicates uh, inflammation in your body. Or we could use this technology for environmental sensing, and we could sense uh, elevated levels of arsenic uh, to indicate water toxicity. Um, once we finished all of this lab scale experimentation, we wanted to move forward and define the final user experience of our product. So we used CAD to design our prototype and then we 3D printed it on campus. Um, this is live photographs of what it looks like. Come by our booth to see it in real life. Um, the base is cylindrical for style and stability. The top is very open concept so that the user can easily access. Uh, the probe station where we can remove and dispose of the probes so that they can be changed for different sensing applications. The probe also moves up and down to access different sample wells. And the LED and the spectrometer are powered with S uh, USB. So based on all of the goals that we set out eight months ago in September, we've achieved all of our primary customer requirements. And in the case of the refractive index sensitivity, we actually exceeded that by quite a lot by sensing 0.0042 refractive index unit change. 
Um, the variance, um, the cross pro variance was sufficient to meet our customer requirements, although in the future we would like to keep working on um, a consistent fabrication procedure where we get even more consistent probe performance, and as well as improve the signal to noise ratio and examine those temperature effects. We were also able to meet our, customer, our secondary customer requirements, particularly uh, regarding the cost, the desktop footprint, and power consumption. So our probe comes in just under a dollar per probe. Um, our prototype is compact, it's portable, and it's very lightweight, um, only about this big. And the power consumption of the sensor specifically is uh, 0.55 watts because it is powered through USB. So the majority of the consumption will come from the computing unit. So if you recall that diagram from the beginning of all of the major market players in the label-free detection market, that same market report from 2012 also mentioned two key market trends. One is that research budgets, especially in industry, are shrinking. So they can't afford these hundreds of thousands of dollars sensing equipment. Um, and another is that the personal diagnostic market is really taking off. You've probably heard of the quantified self movement um, and at home diagnostic tests. It's becoming more and more common. So Sierra's technology is addressing both of these market um, trends by being portable and being extremely cost effective and also extremely versatile. So um, as of yesterday, we officially filed our um, provisional patent on this and in partnership with, um, with Nicoya Life Sciences, who's been sponsoring us, also started by a nano grad. Um, we are working on developing this IP for commercial applications and we hope within the next year to complete all this IP development and see our project to commercial success. Um, thank you very much for listening and we're happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, you're very right. Um, the initial scope of our project wasn't to do the actual biomolecule yeah, sensing. What I saw. Yeah, so um, we haven't done specificity testing, but we did uh, flow through the polyethylene glycol to inhibit the nonspecific binding, right. and that was the step we took just to ensure that the streptavidin was in fact um, binding to the biotin. Yeah. Yes. No, definitely there's a lot more work in terms of experimentally actually determining the limit of detection. We don't have a quantitative value for that right now. Yeah. Yeah, that was the goal of, of that test. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, what is the key novelty here? So you've got a pattern. Yeah. There's an existing technology. You can see an advantage, but what, what can you point to and say this is what? Well, it's the, the novelty is taking inexpensive parts, the, the optical illumination and also the signal, um, the sensing mechanism and integrating that because optical alignment is extremely right. challenging. Uh, it's a collimating lens. Um, so the novelty is in this, the probe design, the, um, the integration of the illumination with the sensing mechanism and the fact that it's extremely portable and um, like single use, so that you don't have to align the optics with the, the sensing, the signal transduction surface. All you have to do is plug it in and the spectrometer reads it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.